Join us for a very special episode of the Magnify podcast as we get to know Pastor Dave and his wife, Sherilyn. We will hear how they met and what their life and ministry looks like and be encouraged by their lives. I'm your host, Darren Miller, pastor of equipping at Grace Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. Welcome to Magnify. Hello, my friends, and welcome. We did it. We made it to the second season of the Magnify podcast. Last season, we had a lot of fun doing this, didn't we, Dave? We did. It was great. It was fun. And we thought we'd take this for another spin, and so thanks for tuning in. Our desire is for this podcast to edify, encourage, and build you up as the Grace family. And if we're able to bring a little levity to maybe your morning commute, then we're happy to do that as well. So as per usual... I'm not alone. You've already heard his voice. I'm joined by my friend and yours, our friendly neighborhood. What do you call it, Dave? You're the pocket pastor? That's right. I'm your pocket pastor. Because you're only one phone call away. That's it. David W. Haig. Dave, thanks for being here, man. <laughs> you know, I really, I loved the first season. And I, I loved that I wasn't on all of them. And I really liked the ones that you had other guests on. So nice job, Aaron. Yeah, we were able to interact with um, kind of what we were putting out there, not just in written form, but also what you were preaching in the pulpit, really marinating that into the congregation for those who streamed in. So Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I love that this could be helpful for our people. But Dave, this is an extra special episode because there is someone who is joining us. Would you like to introduce the person who is sitting to your left? Yeah, this is the best person I've ever met. And uh, when I asked her to marry me, she said yes. And I asked her about 40 times. <laughs> she said yes every time. Uh, Sherilyn Haig, my wife, of 45 years. Wow. Yeah. That's what I say. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Sherilyn. Thanks for taking time to do this. Thank you. Well, we're going to kick off season two with a little fun, a little get to know you exercise with the two of you as a couple. Now, I know that there are already plenty of people who know the both of you. But not everybody. So this is for them. Okay. So you both ready? Yes. Yeah. Question number one. What day of the week did you first meet? Well, I'm going to take this one. I don't recall the day of the week, but I do know that it was a weekday, not a weekend. And I know exactly where I was. I was in line uh, for dinner over at the Masters University, which at that time was the LA Baptist College. And there was a group of new freshmen, you know, standing in front of us sophomores talking. And this one guy was just, I don't know if someone had asked him the question or he just offered, but I thought, oh, here we go. This, uh, he was reciting his um, wonderful deeds that he'd done in high school. I just thought, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> that was the first time I met him. So wait, you're, you're overhearing this? Yeah. Okay. He was okay. like right in front of me. And okay. I just thought, oh, wow. My attitude changed after I got to know him. <laughs> Did, no, can I ask a question off of that? Did you interact with him or you just sit there and oh, kind of no. listen in? And... No, no, no. He was a freshman. David, were you aware that she was <laughs> right behind you? No, I, I was, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was just too big for my britches and I was scared to be. My parents brought me all the way down to LA and left me. I didn't know one person on campus. And so I was going out of my way to, I guess, try and make people think I was worth knowing. But I, it was a little overdone. <laughs> Sherilyn <laughs> loves to tell that story. And I have no defense. <laughs> so, okay, so that's when she first saw you. Right. Where were you when you first saw her? Well, that's easy. There was uh, a night where anybody who wanted to try out for the various music groups could do so. And... Uh, there was one called The Reflections, which back then was big time. And the older I get, the better we were, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm. We were a traveling group, five guys, five girls, piano player. And we were doing up at that point, we were doing really contemporary music for the 70s. And some of us had long hair and some of the Baptist churches wouldn't let us come. But I, I walked in the room and I noticed there were all these sopranos and altos and basses, but only like three tenors. So I became a tenor at that moment, and I was blessed enough to be in the group. But she was trying out, and everybody knew her, 
she got up there to sing and she was super cute and you know everybody knew Sherilyn loved Sherilyn her smile will knock you out so that's the first time I saw her Fantastic. Okay, second question, David. Mm. Where did you take her on your first date? Okay, this could be <laughs> greatly misconstrued. All right? So uh, it was our second year, and we had gotten to be really good friends. So uh, fall of our second year, my sophomore, her junior, we had a thing at LABC where they, they would bring in an evangelist to do five nights of evangelistic meetings, and it was at Placerita Bible Church which is weird because to get in, you had to be a Christian. Mm. So, but they also said, we're still gonna have classes all day, and then you got, you're required to go at night, plus we were required to sing every night. So Thursday, we were just exhausted from everything. So I had a sister, still do, but then she used to live in Garden Grove, and I called her and said, hey, can we come down? So I went to Sherilyn, who's my friend, but by that time I had, deep romantic feelings for her and I said hey I'm getting away to my sister's house do you want to come so our first date was a weekend overnighter which could be misconstrued in the wrong way but it turned out to be great halfway down the the trip I opened up and confided in her that I would like to be more I don't even really know what I said but it was the concentrated Hague charm (laughs) and it just it just turned her heart around and uh but our first real date was we went to see The Hiding Place, and we held hands. Oh, that was you great. Didn't, you didn't pay one second of attention to that play. <laughs> uh, it, it was a movie. a movie. Yeah. Okay, so next question. I was thinking about this for Ingrid and myself. I, I don't know if I could remember this, but what was your first disagreement as a married couple? Oh, it's etched in her mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. She'll, she'll... It is, because we... we normally just get along really well but it was our first anniversary we're in a little volkswagen bug uh blue and we were going to go to seattle we were living in tacoma washington at the time we were going to go to the big city and do something only i had an idea that i wanted to go to the zoo and he thought that was a stupid idea (laughs) so we got into it a little bit and he actually Uh, Do you remember you made a gesture with his hand? He was getting a little animated, and he hit the windshield, and it cracked. (laughs) It cracked. (laughs) It was God. I don't know what that says about you or the windshield. I I barely hit it. It was, I just, who knows what it was. Well, and I did slam the glove glove compartment. I had her get something out of the glove compartment. She opened, and she slammed it. I think that's what loosened the glass. (laughs) Yeah, probably. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that is a story, actually. What does your average weekday evening look like? Now, this is going to be hard, I know. Well, on those nights when we're actually home together, right? Uh, I, I try to get home by 5.30, and we've started something probably for the last 10 years or more. And when I get home, she stops doing what she's doing, cooking dinner or whatever, and we grab something to drink. And in the winter months, we go outside and we watch the sunset because it sets around 5 30 or 6 but we always stop um right now we're sitting inside in the <laughs> in the air-conditioned living room and we just go through each other's day mm-hmm. she tells me everything i got up i showered i ate this for breakfast i read this i did my bible st- whatever and then i go through mine and that's really the way that we can keep each other involved in uh, every as- aspect of our lives how right. many how many nights a week are you able to do something like that? Uh, during the school year, it's not as much. Probably three, and usually on Saturday as well. Yeah. So yeah. Sweet, sweet. Okay, this can be fun. All these hypotheticals that are coming. Okay, David. Yeah. What is Sherilyn's go-to karaoke song? <laughs> you know, I've never seen her do karaoke, but she likes anything by Carol King, and especially. Uh, the one that Carol King wrote, and then somebody else. Actually, Aretha. Aretha sang, "You make me feel like a natural woman." <laughs> so yeah, that that's that's her song. Sherilyn, is that it? It is it. <laughs> I might sound a little better than that, but I, I <laughs> I'll leave so. that up to your imagination. Okay, Sherilyn. So same question for Dave. Okay, so he even kind of looks like him, 
Billy Joel is one of his favorite. Ah, William Joel. Yes, yes. William. <laughs> uh, she has a way about her. Have you done karaoke? No. Have we? We did it with neighbors okay. many, many years yeah. ago. Yeah. We should do a staff right. karaoke day. That'd yeah. Be fun. Ooh. Yeah. There's a line in that uh, song, She's Got a Way, that says, she's got a smile that heals me. And that is so true mm. about my wife. I love that. So, okay, next question. When the two of you are traveling together in the car, just yourselves, what is usually happening? Is there music playing? Is there chit-chatting? You sitting quietly? Well, I'm going to say there's rarely music playing, and I'm not sure why. Yeah, you're musicians. Usually, I know. You would think there would be. But it's a lot of sitting quietly because when you feel so comfortable with somebody, it's easy to sit quietly and just enjoy the ride. And then there's a little chit-chat, too. Mm. Folks, there was one time I was sitting in the back of the car. This is when I was, I was just, I was brand new to Grace. I was at, actually, I think I was in the middle of the interview process, and we were going out to dinner. They were showing me around the town. I don't know if you know this, folks, but David and Sherilyn have like their own unique language. <laughs> oh, that, no. that if you don't, if you're new like I was, you're kind of like, what is going on? I mean, I, I, I can tell they're really into each other, but like. I, I just don't know. They're so unique. It's so kind of cute. They have like all these different like pet names for this and that and for one another. And I was thoroughly confused. But <laughs> one thing I walked away from, they really do love each other very much. That was very evident. Sharon, this is a little bit of an x-ray question, right? Mm. What's one thing you would want people to know about your husband? He actually is, I think, different than people might initially think um because he's he's pretty um intelligent and smart but he is one of the most caring people that i know and he is so like affirming me and especially when i'm just like are you nuts i and he's like no you are like he tells me great stuff about myself and that that's there's nothing better than that and i and he's not like lying. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I love about David, um, which doesn't necessarily apply to me as much, but he has a way of being able to get to the bottom line. And I think that's really, well, it saves a lot of time mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> for one thing, but I think it's, it, he just has a discerning um, spirit about him. And I, I love that. And plus he's fun. He's just fun. Yeah. Dave, some question. Yeah, without a doubt, I would tell you that my wife is one of the best friends. I mean, she's a great friend. Mm -hmm. She stays in touch with people all over the country. Whenever she passes something, it reminds them of Kathy or Jill or whoever. She calls them. She writes to them. Uh, she's just a great friend, and she really, really cares about the relationships. And, you know, we've moved quite a bit, and she has mm -hmm. friends all over the country mm -hmm. And they never fall off the table to her. They're mm -hmm. always her friend. Yeah, we just were on vacation, and she sought out a friend, and it turned out that that friend had turned her life around and was mm -hmm. doing great, and mm -hmm. they spent some time together. So I would say she's a great friend, and I think next to Jesus, uh, she's the greatest gift God's ever given me. We are, we are. I mean, I'm I'm in the limelight all the time, whatever limelight is. I don't even know what that is. But I'm up in front. People look at me, and they sometimes think of Sherilyn as in my shadow. But the reality is that we are equal partners in life and in ministry, and I could not do what I do without her. What I love about both of you is what you see is what you get. Like, going back to those days I was interviewing for the job here, um, you know, my previous church, we had some mutual connections, and it was the chairman of our elders at that church. Uh, Wayne Knowles and I said yeah Wayne tell me about your friend Dave like you know if I'm going to move to California and I'm going to do ministry under him like tell me about him and there was two things that he highlighted he said number one he loves hospitality mm -hmm. he loves hosting he loves having people over he loves people being, you know fe feeling comfortable in his home but number two and probably m more more highlighted than number one is just he so obviously loves his wife, and she so obviously loves her husband. They just are a power couple in that. And, man, it rings true. Oh, and thanks. so I, I came to California like with that lens looking for it to see if it was true. It was very, very obvious. Mm. In the back of your car. 
<laughs> riding around town. Okay, so for both of you, here's a question we'll toss up. Looking back through the years, how did ministry shape your marriage and family? You go. Well, we, you know, we travel, we've moved around a lot. We've lived in Salem, Oregon, Tacoma, Washington, outside of Chicago, Corona, California, and now Santa Cruz. And one of the things we developed, especially with our kids, was wherever we're together, we're okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we moved back to Illinois, and we knew nobody, and we go into a church we'd never been to before in a state we'd never lived in, and it was very, very, very different. And we had basically three little kids, and we just made it an adventure. In fact, we used to play the the song. I don't know who sang it. Saddle up your horses. We got a trail to ride. You know, the great adventure. Oh, Stephen Curtis Chapman. There you go, Stephen yes. Curtis Chapman. Yes, good old Steve. <laughs> and we just used that as a theme song. Wherever we are together, we're okay. And our kids bought into it. They didn't know. So I think I think ministry made us closer as a family hmm. because we were very, very dependent on each other, and we still are. So how did you end up balancing the family and the ministry? Because, you know, they're, look, pastoring is not always easy. There's the congregational expectation. Um, there's, you're, always, you're always kind of in the zone of people's uh, stuff in life because people are going to look to you to help them through their marriage problems, uh, through their issues at work. Um, how, how did you manage all that? I guess following from that, I, I, I'd want to know how did you help protect your family from a lot of the drama that comes with being a pastor as well? Well, I just want to jump in and say, and the first move that we made um, taught us a lot. And Dave dove in. He didn't just kind of jump in up to his knees and then get up the waist. He went head first into his job and um i had a two-year-old and then you know a seven and a nine-year-old and so he dove in and i knew no one i knew everything was flat and i did get lost a few times and i felt um disconnected and it didn't feel good at all Mm -hmm. so that opened up it didn't last long but it lasted for probably first two, three months, we had a powwow, I guess, or whatever, and just talked about it. He listened and took a look at what was going on and went, wow, we got to make a change. And he did. It was fabulous. Yeah, that experience really is what's behind the little lecture I gave you Mm -hmm. and I give everybody else who's ever come to work with me. Uh, I talked to him about the fact that, you know, you're going to hit the ground running. You want to make sure they the church doesn't think they hired the wrong guy. Right. And then you're going to turn around and see your wife, and she's got to find all new doctors and supermarkets and directions. And when Sherilyn said it was all flat, man, you back out of the driveway in St. Charles, Illinois, and there's no ocean, there's no mountain, there's nothing. Hmm. You don't, you can't even remember which way to go, and it's really weird. So that's why I decided I learned the hard way. When you start something, you got to, and you can remember this, I'm sure. You got to find a pace you can keep for 20 years. Right. And it's not s- starts and stops. And if you lose, if you lose your family in ministry, you lose everything. Mm-hmm. Even if they're still there, but if they're just not quite on your side, you you have almost no chance to be uh, to be successful. The other thing is, Sherilyn came up with something because being a pastor's wife is unique. There's nothing else like it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, because it's not even like a politician's wife, because people don't see the wife. Right. But they see my wife every Sunday. They see our kids every weekend. They see you when you're out and about. Yeah. Grocery and store, you live restaurant. With them. Yeah. And so Sherilyn came up with this thing. She said, you know, she would tell ladies in the women's group, if my husband and my Lord are pleased with me, then the expectations other people put on me are are greatly secondary. Mm-hmm. That's been helpful. It was really strange to me that people would, sometimes kiddingly, but sometimes not so kiddingly, would say, mm, and you're you're the pastor's wife. You know, I might mm. say something or or I don't know. And they go, Oh, well you're the you're the pastor's because wife. Because they have a type in their mind yes. of what it's supposed to be. They have yeah. an expectation. And I remember one time asking my sister, 
do people expect you to do certain things, act a certain way because Chuck is an engineer? And we had a big laugh about it, but it is, I mean, that's kind of the bottom line. You're like living in a glass house. Exactly. And, yeah. The truth of it is, is that pastors and wives, we, we make lousy gods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and if somebody wants to put us somehow on a, a, a godlike pedestal, we're going to disappoint them all the time. Mm-hmm. So what we've tried to do is just be real. Right. This is who we are. Right. You want to stop by, you want to talk to us. We're just regular old people that God has called into a, into a pretty wonderful position. Do, have you ever felt the need to protect Sherilyn and uh, uh, shield her from a lot of the stuff you have to deal with? Yeah, I mean, I think every pastor at every level has to come to the place where they realize, okay, there are certain things I'm called to know, and God has gifted me to bear those. Mm-hmm. But my wife isn't called to bear, you know, the the ups and downs. But as we've gone on, my wife has become a, a great veteran of ministry. And so I, I'm sure I share much more with her now. But, you know, I, I've also tried to keep her out of some things— Mm-hmm. where she might have been, you know, just not in the right position and it would have encountered criticism that wasn't fair. Yeah, we've encountered that in our marriage. I mean, as best as I might try to capture the full context of a situation, I'm not able to relay it perfectly. And so what I've then just done for Ingrid is I've given her uh, just a frame, a small frame mm-hmm that then perhaps, depending on what it is, she won't be able to unsee once we're there worshiping together as a right. church family. So I've really got to think through, okay, is this going to be helpful? Will it be profitable right. for our marriage? Right. Will it actually serve ser- serve me in, 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 in working through it? Now, many times, yes, it will serve me. It will serve our marriage because we'll be able to work through it together and communicate. But then there are times I'm like, no, nah, this is a matter of prayer and uh, the discipline of silence. Right. <laughs> yeah. Know, just... right. I think it's harder when you have little kids and kids at home. Yeah. You know, I mean, our kids are an extension of us and they, you know, my kids didn't always look perfectly and act perfectly and know all the answers and do all the memorizations and all that stuff. They were kids. Yeah. But your kids are an extension of you. And so once they're gone and they love Christ and they're out doing well, the pressure's much decreased. Yeah. Honestly. Now, when, when when the kids were young, yeah, you know, you had a lot to manage. How would you help him do that? I mean, he had sermon prep. He had, whether he was doing visitations or elder meetings, what are some things? I mean, that would... probably like every other mom, sure. you just, um, you know, you just do it. You, I don't really think, though, Dave is such a good time manager that um, there weren't a lot of things that I like went, oh, man, I got to do this by myself with the kids today or tonight. I mean, um, I mean, it, for instance, um, when our son was in sports, Dave just was able to make it to all of his games. I don't think you missed any unless you were out of town. Yeah, just on Sunday mornings or something. Right, a, right. You know. But I don't know. You know, it's weird. I'm trying to think back to when our kids were little because they're 41, 38, and 33 now. <laughs> so that I think I've always prided myself in, in being able to get more done in less time. Hmm. And I start early, and I am very organized, and I don't wander around with a coffee cup, you know, seeing how everybody's doing for an hour and a half sometimes. I, I want to spend time with my wife. Right. And back then, I wanted to spend time with my kids. And, you know, I, I had an advantage. I grew up in a pastor's family. Hmm. So it was, uh, I, it was what I reference. knew. Yeah, it was yeah. helpful. Yeah. And I think, you, I think ultimately the people in the church want a pastor who puts his family first. Yeah. I mean, some of them are selfish and think, oh, you should be at my house anytime I want you. But I, I think ultimately people in whom the Spirit of Christ is alive and mature, they want their pastor to do what God calls dads and moms to do Hmm. yeah i want to ask this next question that's not on here what's the hardest part about what you both do in ministry Hmm. well again i went to all this big thing saying expectations i feel it Hmm. and here at grace baptist i haven't felt it like i have in a smaller church or you know it just doesn't seem as prominent here but i'm a people pleaser Mm -hmm. and so I think that's the hardest thing is 
thinking that people are going to want more from me or that they, I don't know, might misunderstand mm -hmm. me. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the hardest things. I also think that it's hard for me when my husband gets criticized mm -hmm. over things that I go, oh, but you don't know the whole story here. Right. Right. <laughs> and so the, and, and you can't go running around set, explaining everything. And of course I don't know everything either, but that's a hard, that's a hard thing. I think for probably most wives, but especially in ministry when people might not understand how much the Lord preaching his word and doing the work of a minister is to a pastor. And I'm going to jump in on that and say that, you know, sometimes we make decisions based on information that we can't share. Yes. Right. And, right. and sometimes we don't make the right decision. Uh, that's happened in my life. It's happened in our lives as elders. But I think the thing that is hardest for me isn't even that. What's hardest for me is that I deeply believe that what Jesus has for us is best for us. And so when I'm counseling, when I'm preaching, when I'm pouring my heart out and bringing the Scripture to bear on people's lives, and they just don't seem to care mm -hmm. to change the things in their lives that are ultimately not satisfying to them. Right. I mean, I've, I've done a lot of marital counseling, and when I tell people, look, when I care more about your marriage than you do, there's something wrong here. So, you know, I think Paul said, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walking in faith, and I, I think that's absolutely true. We as pastors want to see people to be more like Jesus because right. we know it's it's glorifying to God and it's best for them. Right, right. So then let's take it positive, in a positive direction. What's the greatest joy in what you both do in ministry? Oh, wow. Well, it's the flip side of that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Where people are just loving the Lord, they're getting at the light bulbs are going on. And when when you see people go through a difficult time and they, they handle it righteously, that is so cool. Hmm. And plus just, I mean, this is a great place to be. And in ministry, I always hated that. In ministry, I'm in ministry. Um, we're all in ministry. <laughs> Sorry. That's, right. That's true. We just oh, all right. are. We all are. And I just think it's when um, I've, I truly am growing um, in my love for the Lord. And not that I didn't have one before, but it's exciting to realize I, I'm a little bit better with that thing than I was, you know. And so I think it's just so exciting in other people's lives to see that too. And also the staff it, here at Grace Baptist is pretty awesome. It's amazing. We got a good it's team. Great. Yeah. yeah, we got a good team. I think the greatest joy in me is when someone comes to faith in Christ and the greatest joy in that situation is when it's come over time. Mm -hmm. There have been people at every church we've been at who two or three years in or 10 years in, they say, you know, I've been, I've been coming to this church for a long time and I really didn't understand it. And it's now beginning to be clear. And now I, I'm really getting excited about the fact that God loves me in Christ. So to me, that's the, that's the, that's the epitome of ministerial joy. Mm. So if I were to walk a young uh, married couple in here who they're in their first year of ministry and I were to say, you know, here's a gift card, take them out to dinner, what advice would you give them? Well, from my vantage point, I, I, would, I would repeat to the man, look, you want to make sure that people know you're good and da-da-da-da-da. So two things. Number one, find a pace you can keep mm -hmm. forever. Right. Number two, make sure that that pace... Uh, has ample place for your marriage and your kids. As I've said, if you lose their confidence, you, you've lost everything. Right. And then number three, something my mentor told me, uh, strive to deepen your life message and leave it to God to broaden your influence. In other words, just bloom where you're planted, dig down deep, love the people, teach the truth, you know, write, enjoy, do whatever. But but don't have in the back of your mind, oh, I got to build a brand, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to go to a bigger church, and blah blah blah. Uh, God has been gracious to us in that we have never, I've never applied for a job. Hmm. The jobs have already always come to me. I don't, and I'm Grace Baptist is my final place. This is, this is it. I don't have any bigger aspirations than this. Who could? 
<laughs> right? The local exactly. church <laughs> is the primary means whereby God is doing his work today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'd tell them those three things. Mm-hmm. Anything to add to that, Sherilyn? I'd say enjoy your dinner. <laughs> yeah, have fun. <laughs> have fun together. Well, Dave, we're going to do a deeper dive into this uh, next episode, you and I together. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about, you know, you've been diving into the mighty book of Romans. And I think, what, we're into chapter 7 next? We start chapter 7, September 18th. Yeah. Very uh, controversial yeah, chapter. Yeah, it is. Can you give us, I, this might be difficult, but can you give us an understanding of what a typical week of sermon prep looks like for you? I absolutely can. Get, you got it down. Absolutely. All right, walk <laughs> us through it. Uh, I start on Saturday. Saturday's a work day for me. I get into my study, either here or at home, about 7.30, and I immediately begin to work on the text, not for the next day, but for the next, next week. Next week, right. And okay. so Saturday's probably one of the most fun days I have, because I just I let myself go I chase down every theological rabbit, every historical, you know, uh, grammar. Uh, I read a few commentaries, and I just work through the whole text and write a what I call a text study, which for me is a part commentary, part uh, theological illustration, part quote, whatever. And I just love it. And by the end of the day, I hope, if, if all goes well, by 3.30 or 4, I've got a basic outline done and uh, the questions— that are in the Grace Weekly. And then I send my outline, my text, my Grace Weekly, the kids' notes, and my whole text study to about, I think it's up to like 35 people now. No, it's a big list, yeah. I'm on that list. Yeah, yeah, and so you get it. You either get it on Saturday or you get it Monday morning. Right. So then Monday, uh, in the morning on Mondays, it's catch-up day for me. And so I'm doing emails, and then if I can... uh, I write a little bit. I write a Monday morning email to everybody mm-hmm. on our right. staff. What's that called? The from the pastor's desk. From the pastor's desk. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Monday afternoon is all meetings. Uh, Tuesday is chapel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wednesday morning, I take out that text study. Yep. And I start working on my own notes for preaching. And during that time, I've just let it ferment. And I'll be thinking about it, talking about it. I'll talk to you about it, and you might not even know. I'll drop things into Sherilyn's. Uh, conversation. So, but then by what do you call that? You you call that something though, don't you? Like you living in the house? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it just, I built the house, and then I live in it. You're just massaging that into yeah. your rhythms. Yeah, I might even actually be able to preach what some Sunday. Well, <laughs> anathema, but I I because I know what he's going to say. Yeah, sure. Not in total, but I get the gist. So I. I'm done by Wednesday night, hopefully this week, because we were gone on Monday and Tuesday, I actually finished this morning with my notes. Mm -hmm. So by the end of Thursday, I am ready to preach. Then Friday is my day off, and I just, I spend it with Sherilyn. Mm -hmm. We go and do whatever, or we stay home, projects, lawn, whatever, Whatever, but I'm thinking about it, okay? Yeah. And then Saturday, I start again on the next one, keeping the one for the next day fresh. And I, I've told this to other guys, and they go, I don't know how you do that. I really well, don't know how you do it either. I, I, I don't either, I guess. But then I get up on sa- Sunday morning. I get up about 4, and I go in my little study at home, and I pray through it, and I talk through it, and I think about how, you know, what's the song that's coming before? How am I going to transition? Because sure. I like it to be smooth. I, yeah, I think that works. And then I just, I just preach it. Now, you have studied Romans for years yeah. in ministry, but also in education. Yeah. So what about this fresh, most recent study through Romans? I was about to say, what new perspective did you uh, <laughs> No, I don't want to. <laughs> well, N.T. Wright and yeah. I got together. <laughs> no, but like, you know, you titled the series The Obedience of Faith. I have never heard that before. And then you showed it to me. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. No, I see. I, for me, it's always been, right, uh, God's righteousness. Yeah. And, and all that. So can you walk us through kind of... Well, yeah. I mean, the righteousness of God certainly is all there, but it's really the basis upon which faith can come and produce obedience. So Paul tells us in chapter 1, verse 5, and in chapter 16, verse 26, says, this is why I wrote it, to bring about the obedience of faith. And I would tell you that, that chapters 1 through 8, and then 9 through 11 are his apology, his defense of of the current state of Israel, all of that 
is just meant to say, because God has done all these things for us in Jesus Christ, his saving activity is righteous in both judging sinners and saving by faith those who believe. But it's almost like at the end of, or in the beginning of chapter 12, he says, I told you all that, and now I'm really going to get to you my burden, Mm -hmm. why I wrote this. Therefore, by the mercies of God, what are the mercies of God? Chapters 1 through 11, the way God has displayed his righteousness, his saving activity, he's displayed it in Jesus Christ. Therefore, what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. In other words, give him who you are, lock, stock, and barrel. And that kind of obedience only comes from faith. The law will not produce the kind of faithful obedience that, you know, people, and legalism won't either. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, if the reason you're obeying is so God will give you stuff, mm-hmm. that's not faith-driven. I don't know about you, Dave. It sounds like a book, man. <laughs> it's the <laughs> sequel to the obedience option. It's called Faith-Driven Obedience. A little soft opener there. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I got so many books. Oh, it's great. You've, yeah. you've blessed the church through it. Yeah. So how is, as you've been studying Romans, how is Romans a timely message in today's highly secularized, highly psychologized world? Well, I think the main thing that comes out of Romans in Romans 12, 1 is the key verse. You're not your own. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be your own. If you get to the place, you say, I'm in charge of my life. If it's to be, it's up to me. We call that the sovereign self. Then you have to take responsibility for everything that happens. When you're sad, when things don't work out, when your life crumbles, guess what? You can't blame anybody. You can't blame your parents. You can't blame your teachers. You can't blame society. You can't blame, you certainly can't blame God because you said, I am my own. I'm going to pull my own strings. I'm going to look out for number one. But the elegant thing about Jesus Christ is, well, the Heidelberg Catechism says, what is my only hope in life and death? My only hope in life and death is that I am not my own but belong body and soul to my loving Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, how much more elegant can life be than to say, the one who created all things, who never makes mistakes, and only asks of me what is best for me, loves me, has cradled me in the arms of his righteousness, accepts me, and has put me into a group of people that he also accepts to bring in glory. Mm. Wow. So we must... We want to obey out of love, not just so we'll get stuff, but so we can be useful to the one who loves us. I love that. Dave, I am looking forward to diving into Magnify Season 2 with you, man. This going to be fun. We're well, you know it. what I think about you. You are the closest thing I have to a brother right now, so... Thank you for that. I love the both of you. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Sherilyn. This has been way fun. Well, folks, thanks for streaming in to our first episode of season two. Like Pastor Dave said, we're going to be diving into the content of what we're providing in the pulpit and marinating that into special guests and talking practically about how that is lived out Monday through Friday. So please be sure to stream in and to join us next time on Magnify. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to the Magnify podcast so you never miss an episode. All the resources we recommend can be found in the Grace Library, so please be sure to check that out. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Thanks so much for streaming.